why do we need interviews? What, what's so attractive um, about interviewing people? Um, well, just to give you a, an idea about what's involved here when people talk to each other and people are asked questions and, and answer, I thought I'd look at this, the, the symbolic interactionist view of things. Symbolic interaction has been a very important kind of movement in social research. It lies behind a lot of the, um, the recent discussions of, uh, particularly the constructivist discussions, of the way in which meaning is transferred from people to people, in which we understand each other, and the ways in which we are using that process to do various kinds of things. So it's been an extremely, extremely important kind of, of um, philosophical position in, in social research. So here's a symbolic interactionist model of, of what question and answer behaviour looks like. When you ask a question, you get an answer and so on. And uh, just, I've, I've done it in this rather uh, neat diagram, four stages, four kind of things that happen, starting at the top left with an interviewer asking a question. The interviewer wants to know something. So the first thing they do is they encode the question. They think through, how am I going to say this? They do it rather rapidly, of course. We don't really think long about it, although sometimes we may do. Sometimes we may ponder about how to ask the question. But most commonly, we just ask it. We think about it very quickly. And when you do so, the interviewer takes into account their own purposes, their presumptions about what, what's, what the person knows, what situation they're in, who they are, what's going on in the world, and so on. Uh, their knowledge about the respondent and, and their, their, uh, their interests and so on. Um, and the perceptions of, of the respondent, their presumptions. So, that, you know, what's going on here is a lot of thinking about not just what do I know about this situation, but what does the person I'm asking know? What can they say? What, where are they coming from? What, are they, you know, what, what kind of view of the world do they have? And so on. A lot of that's built in just to the very start of the interaction, the question itself. So you can see already we've got a whole range of levels of meaning just as the first question is being asked. The second stage, then, is a respondent hearing the question. They have to listen to what's being said to them, what's being asked of them, and work out what that means. They have to decode the question. They have to go through taking into account their own kind of purposes, presumptions. I've been asked this. What can I do now? How can I answer this? What's going on? How does that affect me? Um, what, what do I want to tell the other person back? What, what, what can I tell them? What do I know about it? And so on. A whole set of questions about my, you know, the, my, the respondent's perceptions and, uh, and the presumptions and knowledge they have and so on going on here. It's not a clear-cut issue of I just simply answer. I have to work out how I'm going to answer that question if I'm the respondent. So that's going on, first of all, in the respondent, trying to work out what can be said. And part of that also, I have to say quite interestingly, is what can the respondent say that in some way is going to satisfy the interviewer, the, the questioner, um, in their answer? What kinds of things count as, as proper answers? Uh, what kind of things can I say? And there's a whole learning process in that which we become very aware of. Um, I'm, uh, I, I, recently I saw a, a, a wonderful, um, I think I saw it, maybe I heard it on the radio. No, I, actually I think I heard it on the radio. A wonderful short extract of an interview done many years ago, probably back in the 1940s, with um, a, a man who didn't know how to be interviewed. And I'll come back to this in just a moment about the interview society we live in. Um, but what's interesting is that being interviewed is something you have to learn. It doesn't come naturally. We all do that. We all, as we grow up, learn how to answer questions, what to say back to when somebody asks us questions and so on. But this man hadn't learned how to be interviewed by the media. So there was this reporter asking him questions about how did you feel about so-and-so? And, and, and uh, what he gave back was simply yes and no answers most of the time. Yes, no, fine, you know, I did it. And that, that was about it. He, 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 you know, the, the interviewer had real struggle with him trying to work out, to get, trying to get him to say anything but very short answers. And you could see what was going on here was that the man just didn't know how to be interviewed. Well, now, Mr. Crandall, you tell me about Tunbridge Wells. I don't know anything about it, only it's Tunbridge Wells. But you've lived here, I believe, since you were 18. That's right. What's the nicest thing about Tunbridge Wells? What, what? What's the nicest thing about Tunbridge Wells? I don't know. Don't you know anything nice about it? No. 
Nothing at all. No, I know nothing about Tunbridge Wells. Uh, tell me, can you tell me anything about the pan tile? Hmm? Can you tell me anything about the pan tile? No, I don't know anything about the pan tiles. I know it's the pan tiles. That's all I know about it. Um, and uh, can you tell me anything about changes in transport here? I suppose once upon a time there were horses, where now there are motor cars. No, I can't tell you anything about that. I don't know what you want me to say. If I can say anything to please you, I will, but... Oh, what you're saying delights me. Hmm? What you're saying delights me. I oh. want you to tell me something about living in Tunbridge Wells. Well, I can't tell you. I lived in Tunbridge Wells. That's all I know about it. And this is what's going on at this stage. The respondent has to think through what kind of things can I give back? What's required in this interaction of the interview to give back to the, the interviewer? So that's going on before they reach the second, sorry, the third stage, which is encoding that, thinking, okay, now I know what kind of things are wanted. Right, how do I put it? How do I say it? Um, and again, the whole process of taking into account what, what they know, what they can say, and so on and so forth. What, you know, what kind of way to express it, how, how long to, to speak for, how short to speak for, and so on. All those kind of things now come into play. Um, so a lot of knowledge and a lot of uh, presumptions, a lot of background information comes into play to, to, to work out how to express that. This is the, the skill, if you like, that that man in the interview, who didn't know how to be interviewed, um, the, the skill that he lacked comes into play in, in stage three. So at this stage now we've got the respondent giving an answer, and the interviewer now hears the answer. And they have to work out what that all means. And that's the last stage here. They have to decode the answer. What is going on here? What is this person saying? How can I understand what they mean by what they say? And it's not necessarily transparent when that happens. That the respondent saying one thing, the interviewer has to work out what, does that, what are they really saying by that? What do they mean by what they're doing here? In some cases, it may be fairly simple, some straightforward factual answers, but in... But even then, there's usually a level of meaning going on, which is beyond the mere facts. Things that tell you about what that person believes, thinks, their feelings, their emotions, their presumptions, their pre presuppositions, and so on, uh, that are going on in that talk. Okay, so I've laboured the point perhaps a little bit here, but what, I, what I'm trying to show in this example is just how many levels of interpretation, of meaning, of, um, of background knowledge, and so on, go on in a very simple interaction of question and answering. And as social scientists, we have to come to grips with that problem when we are interviewing somebody. It's not just simply a, ma simply a matter of asking a question and getting an answer. There's a whole set of other levels of meaning going on here. And a lot of social science is concerned with those processes, with what's happening and how we can pull that out and understand it. And to some degree, perhaps, eliminate it. Um, we can kind of write it out by saying, actually, we're not interested in that. We're interested in these answers. But we have to bear that in mind because it might bias our results. In other cases, we have a direct interest in that process. We're particularly interested in how people see things, interpret things, and relay their interpretations to us in their, in their answers. So th this process is, is, is at the heart, if you like, of the interview procedure and of the social science uh, that comes from interviews. Now, I mentioned this just now when I was talking about the man who didn't know how to be interviewed. Um, the... Um, Several people have noted that these days we learn very quickly how to be interviewed. We live in an interview society. Um, David Silverman, um, a British sociologist, is one of the people who's, who suggested this as a, as a way of seeing things. In our modern society, we can't escape the interview. The interview is everywhere. Um, <coughs> as um, part of the preparation for this, I, recently I went on to YouTube to see if any good videos about how to do research interviews. Um, I found one set, I, I'll put it on to UniLearn for you, but I found one set about research interviews, uh, which, which are quite useful. What I did also find, though, was an enormous number of other videos about how to be interviewed, particularly how to be interviewed for jobs. The job interview is one key area of that. But also a lot on how to be an interviewer if you are working for the media, if you're working for TV or radio or, or, or newspapers. And you can see that the news interviews, the talk show interviews and so on, the documentaries with interviews, are very common forms of interview that we are uh, familiar with all the time. We see what's going on and we learn very quickly how to play that game. If we were to be interviewed now, we'd know very quickly how to answer, what, we, what is expected of us in interviews. 
Um, and as Filthman says, in the, the quote at the bottom here, interviews pervade and produce our contemporary cultural experience, a knowledge of our authentic, personal, private selves. And it's that, that last point is particularly important. The way we come to know and see ourselves is through the way that others do in interviews, that the way that people in you know, talk shows and so on present themselves is the way that we learn to do the same thing, present ourselves. So interviews then pervade society as well as being a very, a, a, you know, a key uh, a technique for, for research and data collection. Another thing to bear in mind before we start about the actual procedures of interviews is that different kinds of um, theory, epistemological positions, different ideas about what knowledge is and what we're trying to find out, may lead us to different questions, different interviews, different kinds of, of research interviews. And uh, this, this, um, the, these, this example here comes from Jennifer Mason's book. Um, she's now a professor at uh, Manchester University. Um, <clears throat> where she argues that the different ontological position we have, ontological position means different ideas about what we're looking at, what there is in the world, what things are there to examine, to, to, to find out about. That's ontology, what's there, what exists. Different questions about that, or different ideas about ontology, lead us to different kinds of research questions, and hence, of course, different interviews. And she suggests that the knowledge we're looking for, the kinds of questions we ask, must be related to that point. And here's an example which she takes from uh, you know, different kinds of research about racism. And she suggests uh, three, of course there can be many more than this, but just to give you an example of the range here, the, the three that she suggests. One study of racism might be about attitudes. You know, we want to find out about people's attitudes towards um, either the idea of racism or towards other races or towards the, the, the concept itself of racism. So we then, if, we, we, if that's our research question, we have an idea there are such things as attitudes. Attitudes are things that can be discovered and measured and so on. And they're meaningful components of, of the world we live in. That, that there are things that are there, the ontology again. There are things that are there that we can look at and examine. And so our research focuses on that. And we might then have a set of interviews that are based around trying to get to grips with attitudes and people's attitudes. Their underlying motivations, you might say. A quite different study would be interested in a different thing. It would be interested in discourses, the way that people use their words, their language, to construct ideas and, and to, to work with, with ideas and concepts with which they communicate with others. So in, in a, this kind of approach, this discursive approach, we look at the way people use words to construct the world that they live in, the world that they, they move in with their, their, their talk and their language. And so we look at the words they use and the way that they construct those concepts from uh, their use of the words. <clears throat> and so racism then becomes a particular construct that people have. And different people may understand differently, may use the term differently. They may use you know, various terms within the racist discourse, if you like, um, different terminology for different kinds of people. And we look at how that's done or how that's not done in, in the case of other people. So a quite different study, and we're asking different questions, different ontology about what there is to, to, to examine. And the last example Mason gives is a study of institutional racism, where we're looking at the way that institutions operate to be racist or not racist, however they operate. Um, and we're then looking at, at, at organisational phenomena. Um, we may look at what people say, but more than that, we're looking at how people organise themselves, how they run their organisations, their, you know, the, um, the media or the universities or the, the, the you know, manufacturing companies or, or the political parties, whatever. We're looking at different kinds of organisations here. The way they're, they're structured and the way they operate at a structural level. And we're therefore looking at different kinds of things about the way they're managed and the way that people work within them and so on. Um, and we ask different kinds of questions and we, we make different kind of assumptions about what there is there that's governing the way people act. In this case, the organisational structures might govern the way they act. So a, a different set of questions again. So interviews then can, can be at a different kinds of levels, different kinds of phenomena that we're identifying and, and therefore different kinds of research that comes out of it. All of these can be done by interviewing people. <clears throat> 